Well, hello to everyone who is joining us on election week to hear our first reactions to the results from this Tuesday. We are recording this program on Wednesday evening, so it's been about one full day since all the polls closed. We've already got a pretty big, uh, pretty good picture, I should say, about what's happened in most of the major races. But funny enough, it's not yet a complete picture of control of either of the chambers of Congress. Because even though we've got results from almost every race, we still can't say exactly who is going to control either the U.S. House or the U.S. Senate in the next Congress, which is pretty remarkable. By this point in any previous election cycle, as far as I can recall, even though we've had some presidential results that lasted a bit longer and some Senate results that lasted a bit longer, we usually at least knew who had control of the U.S. House at this point. So it's really a mixed picture. It's a very balanced picture for the results of this election. The country, as many people have observed, is rather close to 50-50 in its partisan leanings. And we've got a result that reflects that. We're looking at a U.S. House that's incredibly close to 50-50. I think that most of the aggregators, projectors, are expecting that the House will be in control of the Republicans but only by a very narrow majority. And then the U.S. Senate is completely undetermined with a result that's going to be shockingly close to 50-50, just as it was in the last Congress. That is true, John. And, and I think that ultimately this is a historic night for Democrats. If you go back to 2002, President George W. Bush's first midterm, a full 20 years, you'll see that President Trump lost, I think, roughly 40 seats in 2018. And then President Obama in 2010, his first midterm, he lost 60 seats. I think it was 63. And then Bill Clinton in his first midterm. He lost control of the US House for the first time in, I think it was 40 years. 40 years in his first midterm. And then the one outlier was George W. Bush in the middle of the war. He gained eight seats. So the Democrats are, if Biden only loses, you know, the House by five seats and it's R plus five for the Republicans in the House, that is historic, especially if they're able to maintain hold in the Senate. And it looks that way because uh, Democrats might lose Nevada. It's still too early to tell. They're probably going to win Arizona. So those will cancel out. And then we're left with a runoff in Georgia, those poor folks in Georgia, to decide uh, the, the control of the U.S. Senate. So that is all to say, John, that we will get into the messaging. We will get into the candidate quality. But I think we need to start with the fundamentals of the race. Because as you know, one of my great theses is that consultants, the like myself and, and those that I work with, ultimately overblow messaging and how important that is. And more specifically, when the fundamentals are extremely bad, there's just in many instances, nothing you can do to overcome those fundamentals. Ultimately, looking at the results, we would have to make the argument, if you subscribe to my theory, that the fundamentals weren't that bad. Yeah, it's funny you are talking about a historically successful election for the Democrats when we're discussing an election that the Democrats might lose, right? We're saying this was historically successful, but they're still likely to lose at least one and maybe even both congressional chambers. And if you look at what we know so far about the popular vote in the U.S. House, the Republicans are on track to win by something like 6%. So that's a pretty clear win. And we know that there's been some past elections where the Democrats actually won the national popular vote for the U.S. House, but lost control of the chamber or couldn't get control of the chamber because of the way uh, geographical districts are designed, right? It's typically understood to underscore that point. Yeah. That- to ensure control, Democrats need to win by 6 or 7%. Yeah. So the Republicans winning the House popular vote by 6%, you know, that's them winning the election, right? But we're saying that this is still a successful election to Democrats. And why is that? There's a few different reasons. One is the pattern that you already mentioned, Justin, which is such a strong pattern. It's such a strong pattern. And, you know, patterns in politics last until they don't. I remember in Virginia, it was for 100 years, every single time the governor race went to the party other than the one in the White House. And then one year, it just didn't, right? <laughs> Patterns last until they don't. And when you have a small sample size in your pattern, you can only barely call it a pattern, but you get very ingrained in your thinking about it. So, you know, we gave our examples of these recent presidents in their first term, in the first election since their term started, 
And we, we have like four examples. And it seems like such a clear pattern, but it's really not that many cases to draw from. So it's setting up maybe an unrealistic expectation for what exactly is going to happen. The other thing is that I think that many political watchers have come to the conclusion that the polls are undercounting Republicans because there were undercounts of Republicans, especially in the 2020 election and also a bit in the 2016 election. So people were expecting that pattern was going to hold. There's also this truism that Republicans turn out much more in the so-called midterm elections, the elections where a president isn't up for election. I don't know to what extent that's really accurate, but you do hear that a lot. So people expect Republicans will do well in those elections. And then a third thing is that there's been all this talk about how bad the economy is and how unpopular President Biden is. And this is also building the expectation that the Republicans were going to have a big, big, big election where they won 50, 60 seats, or I should say they flipped 50, 60 seats in the House, winning much more than that. Some of that thinking was a bit flawed. You know, the polls turned out to be pretty accurate. Like I said, the pattern of presidents doing their president's parties doing poorly in the first election since the president was elected, very few cases. And then I think that the fundamental aspects that are often looked at, which is the state of the economy and the president's approval rating, might have been a little bit misinterpreted by many in the pundit class. Things that the economy really is not quite as bad as we are sometimes hearing. We know that inflation is a genuine problem, right? And it is. And nobody should discount that. But inflation in the United States is lower than it is in most of our peer countries. How many voters are aware of that? I can't really say, but it's true. The other thing is that the unemployment rate is very, very low right now. We're at almost full employment. That is a very, very different situation from the 2010 election, which was the first election since President Obama was elected in 2008, where the Democrats got wiped out in the congressional election. In that case, the unemployment rate was about 10%. So unemployment seems to be a bigger problem for voters in these elections, perhaps, than inflation. And this was a decision that the Democrats made while they were designing public policy, right? Because they looked at the case of the post-2008 recession and global financial crisis, and they said, what we did then was we underspent, so we would have low inflation, but we stuck with low employment because we did not put enough stimulus in the economy to really get jobs moving at a fast pace. This time they did something very different. They overspent. It caused inflation to rise, but it also kept unemployment really low. And so we can look at how voters responded to those two different outcomes, and we can say that perhaps unemployment matters more for voters than inflation. I think that ultimately we do have a large historical record going back to FDR of the party in power when they control all the chambers in their first midterm, losing a bunch of seats. So that is to say it's still a small sample size in the grand scheme of things. Um, But ultimately, these things tend to hold. I think your point on unemployment is interesting in that maybe it is worse or more important to voters than inflation. I I think ultimately what we're seeing here is, and I'm not an economist, so I'm not going to take it from that angle, but this is the bet not even from a policy initiative. This is the political bet that the Biden administration made. Their messaging largely was focused on democracy and abortion, which both of which we'll get into later. But what they ultimately told their fellow Democrats was that the economy isn't as bad as people are making it out to be. Uh, Let's not dwell on it and focus too much on it. And in certain instances, there were candidates like Abigail Spanberger, who, John, I was getting so sick of these political ads at the end of the campaign. It was all abortion. Abortion, 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 abortion. I never heard one thing about the economy in her political ads for the last two or three weeks. So that is to say, I think fundamentally, when we're talking about the economy, you're probably right. Even if it wasn't necessarily unemployment, meaning more than inflation, uh, it was very clear that the economy was not nearly as bad as the political pundits were making it out to be. Yeah, I mean, I want to give credit to a writer for New York Magazine who also raised this point about the economy. And the difference between the way voters respond to inflation and unemployment, and that's Eric Leibitz. It's also been something that I've been thinking about. I think we talked about previously on the show, but he made this point today. So I want to make a reference to the article that he wrote on this topic. You know, there's more than one factor in the economy. Uh, Often when Pond is talking about the fundamentals, how's the economy doing? How's the president's approval rating? But the economy is many things. It's unemployment, it's inflation. It's also 
uh, the stock market, right? Wages. Yeah, wages. Another good example. The stock market. For a lot of people, their major reference point for how the economy is doing is the stock market. And the stock market has been doing very poorly this year. I think the S&P 500 lost about a third of its value just in 2022. So there's lots of different things in the economy. And then there's also uh, the industry-specific reference points, people who work in energy, their idea of how the economy is doing, people who work in construction. And then there's the global picture. How does the US economy compare to how our peers are performing? The picture of how the economy is doing is, is complex. It's not yes or no. And I do want to jump in here. I think there is a very big danger that we and this writer at the New York Magazine is running into with trying to simplify such a nuanced topic issue down to one indicator, right? A unemployment rate. Leading up to the elections, we saw a bunch of approval polls overlaid with gas prices, and they nearly matched, right? It's it's a, a, a problem that most humans fall into, looking for the silver bullet. This one thing is going to explain a wide-ranging phenomena. And, and if we just understand this one point, we'll be able to understand the larger world outside and, and really see what is going on. Um, so I, I would say this, Mr. Gunnison, I think that looking at the stock market, I, I, I don't think your normal average run-of-the-mill voters cared about that, but I do think your pundits cared about it because as they're looking at the stock market, they're seeing their bank accounts go down because they're high six, seven-figure salaries and they're investing in the market. Um, so therefore, they're more likely to provide a negative commentary on the economy. In addition to that, there is a bubble, whether you're working in DC in politics or New York in the media or in DC in the media. Uh, these folks tend to be divorced from your blue collar working class Americans because they're not blue collar. They're, they're white collar and they're not spending the majority of their time uh, traveling the US or talking to these folks. So ultimately, some type of groupthink begins to permeate. And also, there's the influence of politicians, uh, the messaging that they try and do to the, the news media and the economic media and the political media, where you have Republicans pushing the message of inflation being the end all be all. You have foreign markets very concerned about inflation because their inflation is much higher than the US. Uh, and lastly, you have Democrats privately off the record, like consultants we've even had on this show, explaining to their colleagues in the media how inflation is the number one issue and Democrats can't seem to run away from it and there's no message. Um, so that all conspires to be this doom and gloom that fits with the priors of the party in power always doing poorly in the first set of midterms, where people now assume that because the economy is so bad, because their friends are telling them it's so bad, because other people in politics are telling them it's so bad, it's going to explain a phenomena that is a pattern that people just assume is going to happen. So I think there was some doom and gloom. And the fundamentals, like you, you said, weren't that bad. Yeah, it's funny, Justin, that you posed this theory that is believed by many that gas prices might be the one key to understanding political outcomes, that they track exactly with the performances of parties or candidates. And you know who I think might actually have fooled themselves perhaps into believing that is Joe Biden, Ron Klain, and the White House. The way that they were behaving this last year suggested that they might themselves believe that gas prices were the key to everything. You know, treating like the American Strategic Petroleum Reserve like it's our state oil company and <laughs> releasing barrels of oil through the SBR as a way of trying to manipulate the gas market rather than as an emergency, uh, you know, um, fire alarm type last resort. And this very unfortunate recent chapter in US Saudi relations, which seemed like they were perhaps colored very much by the president's desires towards the election outcome, which there's plenty more to say about that. But it does seem like they were perhaps believing that gas prices were everything. And they were acting rather desperate in regard to the gas price issue. Let me very quickly agree with you and underline your point. On election day, I can't remember if this was in, it was in Bloomberg, I believe. There was a story, or Politico, there was a story that I read that said, the White House is bracing for massive turnover. This is on election day before the votes are counted. So you can tell they're bracing for a complete wipeout. And one of the anecdotes they used was, and John, you and I have had this argument, uh, they told Mr. Ronald Klain repeatedly to stop tweeting because if he tweets, 
ultimately it might get him in a hot water. And the anecdote they used was Mr. Klain had been tweeting repeatedly about lower gas prices and President Biden being responsible for lower gas prices. And then gas prices before the election ticked up and folks used this information against Mr. Klain to undermine his standing in the White House. So that is to just make your point that gas prices and the White House and overemphasizing the importance of that metric, the current administration appears to have done so. Yeah, they were expecting it was going to wipe them out. And it's funny also, Justin, that you mentioned that pundits live in a bubble and that they're not interacting with ordinary people, because this is a critique that is often raised in an attempt to suggest that the pundits are misunderstanding the white working class or Republican leaning voters in middle America. But it, the fact is that in the last election cycle, the pundits were overestimating how Republicans were going to do among those voters. So the the way that the bubble is reinforcing group thought isn't that archetype from pre-2016. It's an overcorrection. It's these pundits, in many cases, in a bubble, torturing themselves with their fear that they're misunderstanding their concept of middle America so much that their concept of middle America is a more powerful force than they would otherwise imagine if they had perhaps spent a bit more time in the wild. I remember I was at a rural diner a few weeks ago. This is a joke, right? Well, no, it's true. <laughs> I was in a, I was in a rural diner. Folks, join us on the diner safari with Mr. John Gunnison. I was on my rural safari in a diner listening to people <laughs> talking, white collar, I'm sorry, blue collar lads, you know, talking about politics. And I was like, oh my God, I'm in the New York Times article right now. I'm overhearing these two scruffy gentlemen talking about the election in a diner, literally in a very rural town. And they were criticizing Republicans. They were chatting with each other about like, oh, can you believe that Herschel Walker pulled out a fake police badge on a debate stage? What a clown. I was like, wow, you know, my redneck safari is, uh, if I can be a bit crude, uh, teaching me something different than I was told that I would learn from many New Yorker, New York Times and New York Magazine articles. I I think we just found the answer to why Democrats overperformed. White working class males were upset with Herschel Walker and his prop badge and the pageantry of the GOP. (laughs) There's a perception that many Democrats are spending too much time online and misunderstanding the way normal people think and talk. I think this is a really big problem on the Republican side. And, you know, what you've just mentioned, what I just mentioned is one illustration of that. This incident with Herschel Walker and the fake police badge. I mean, how does that play among normal people who aren't? you know, plugged into the online bubbles of extreme partisan politics, it's a bit ridiculous. And many of the ways that a lot of Republican candidates have been talking for the last couple of years is totally divorced from the way ordinary people think, talk, and behave. I mean, I would challenge you to try to find someone who speaks, behaves anything like Donald Trump out there in the world, anything like Lauren Boebert, anything like, you know, Ted Cruz, Matt Gates. These terminally online candidates, uh, J.D. Vance, are you going to meet a lot of people who speak the way he does and act the way he does out in the world? Josh Mandel, are you going to meet a lot of people like that? I mean, it's not the way that people talk, you know, hating sports, um, speaking constantly about conspiracy theories, talking about obscure uh, minute like the Christopher Steele memos as if it's the most important topic in the world. Let me just, again, underscore this. You're, you're really on your soapbox right now, and, and I'm loving it, Mr. Gunnison. I don't mean that in a, in a derogatory way. You're making a lot of great points. Even the election denial is an online thing. Because I, yeah. honestly, John, I could not, we are, we are as unplugged in as it gets. I could not explain to you the, the election denial theories. I know there's one about Iran and Venezuela and servers and China and all this crazy shit. But to your normal voter that isn't the, you know, 60% of the Republican electorate that believes this stuff, which is only, you would assume, 30% of of the voters, because it's roughly half of one party, they they just look at this and they're like, what the fuck are you talking about? This is, wasn't the 2020 election almost three years ago, two years ago? (laughs) Like that, that's the question. I mean, they're becoming like Star Trek fans. It, yep. It's a cult TV show that you have to be a fan of to understand the lore. You know, if you're a fan of weird incel Trumpism, 
then you've seen 2000 mules. You were first in line and you can recite it A to B, A to Z, I should say, or A to Z for any of our international listeners. But if you're not in that world, you've got no idea what these people are talking about when they reference anything in it. There was a uh, a quote, I think from Maggie Haberman recently, where she was talking about Trump's proposed rationale for another presidential campaign. She said that the main point of the campaign is going to be revenge, personal revenge. And it's like, how could this possibly be compelling to any ordinary voter? The only way in which this would be a compelling campaign concept or prospect to you would be if you interact with politics and government more as a fan of a character than as someone who you know, wants outcomes in your own life related to the economy, related to public safety, and so on. He wants the politicians to make it easier to put food on your table, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, deal with climate change, health care issues. National security. Things that sane people tend to care about. It's Instead, it's rooting for your favorite character in a TV show to beat the other character in a TV show. This is not compelling for ordinary voters who have anything at stake. And so this fan approach, this online approach, this world in which you need to be following the TV show to understand the characters and storylines, this is going to miss with so much of the electorate. And I think that that's what happened in a lot of races this last cycle. I agree with you. And so we talked about fundamentals. Folks, John and I are on the same page. He really won me over. Him and the election results won me over. I think he was saying for quite some time that the economy wasn't that bad in our talks offline. So I'll give him credit for that. Um, we didn't get into abortion, which we'll get into because I think that that was a fundamental issue in, in the Democrats' favor. We just broached the MAGA issue. So that is to say, moving from fundamentals, we're now talking about candidate quality. And in a lot of these races in the Senate, even in the House, the Republicans had prime opportunities to overperform or perform like they should have and, and pick up these seats. You had these Trump freaks. Either Trump endorsed these folks in primaries, like Blake Masters in Arizona and in, in this online ultra mega stuff, or in, in there are a variety of, of other candidates, um, or you had House districts where this stuff plays very well in the primary because the vote share of the primary in these midterms especially is minor relative to a general election vote share or even uh, specifically a presidential year general election vote share. So what what does that mean? That means the grassroots fanatics. That means the fans. Fanatic is in the word. The fans of these people ultimately drive who is selected, along with some help from Democrats, where the Democrats were like, ooh, these people who are too online, ooh, who are very odd, oddballs and maybe they're 20 like very young um we're gonna put them up because they are so out of touch with reality and real americans we have a better chance and we saw that john in new hampshire's first district where chris pappas won an election that by any stretch of the imagination this gentleman should not have won regardless of the fundamentals in a midterm year that the house the senate and the white house is controlled by the presidency no matter how good of a candidate he is that's the district i'm from it tends to be pretty damn even flip republican to democrat almost every year and they put up this trump like candidate so so i think that that is an example to say it's not only that they have to be endorsed by and loving outwardly President Trump. I, I think that it's a combination of that and also them just having these more extreme conservative policies that are simply outside the mainstream. For anyone listening, Justin is not exaggerating when he's talking about New Hampshire's first district. This is the prototypical swing district in the United States. I think, and this is not an exaggeration, I think that there was a solid 10-year period five or six consecutive elections where the seed flipped back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And it's a great example of what we think of as a bellwether. And in this race, the Republicans nominated a young woman, 25 years old, whose campaign website talks about her job application as if it's a reason that, to elect her to Congress. And it's really remarkable. Uh, it looks like it was written for a high school uh, or a college essay, her campaign biography and campaign statement. And I mean, this is just very junior league stuff. And it's a real waste of an opportunity for the Republicans. And they got hit really hard 
across New England. They had a few different house pickup opportunities in Maine, in Rhode Island, in New Hampshire, in the New Hampshire Senate seat, crucially, and they lost all of them. And what Justin is saying about these uh, cra- you know, nutty candidates, we are collecting so much evidence that the whole MAGA cult thing is a, a big fat election loser. And it's getting harder and harder to deny that. And many people were interested in denying that for as long as possible. That's part of why the election conspiracy theories are so compelling for people, because they don't want to admit that the MAGA profile is an electoral loser. But let's just take a look at the history. Yes, Donald Trump won the Electoral College while losing the national popular vote in 2016, and he won a few states that was quite surprising. Republicans hadn't won in a while, right? So there's the point in that column, one point in that column. Let's look at all the other stuff that we can put in the other column to argue against MAGA's power as a political concept. 2018 elections, the economy. Wait, wait you got to start with 2016. The Democrats gained six seats in the House. In 2016? Yes. I didn't even know that. <laughs> That's how strong the uh, narrative of 2016 is ingrained in our heads. Uh, let's look at 2018. This was an election cycle in which the economy was excellent, excellent. And the Republicans got wiped out. They lost the House. Even with the economy humming, that shows you what the voters at the time were thinking about Trump. This was before COVID. This was before either of the two impeachments. This is when the economy was doing great. They got rocked. 2020. So, so, so they lost seats in 2016 when they were running on MAGA. They lost seats in 2018 when they were running on MAGA. 2020, they lose the Senate and the White House. I think this is the first time in American history that a president flipped a trifecta against his own party within a single term, right? And he did it again while the economy um, you know, had been quite good for a lot of his term. And we were dealing with this COVID disaster that had helped incumbents in a lot of other countries. He sabotaged, possibly even by design, the U.S. Senate elections that went to runoff in Georgia in that cycle, right? Uh, it's it really is quite unusual for a president to lose re-election. Uh, it, it's only happened a few times uh, in the 20th century and and further. Now we're ahead into this cycle, and we're looking at these MAGA candidates run so far behind the other candidates that were running on their same party's ticket. So we've got a few good examples here. New Hampshire, we already talked about the Republican governor of New Hampshire romped landslide election. He's a good governor, but. John Sununu. Yes. But the uh, uh, Republican that was nominated for U.S. Senate, who was one of these MAGA election denier nutters, he lost. And he ran so far behind where the governor was running. That's Don Bolduc. In Georgia, we had the incumbent governor. I, I probably should have saved this example for last because it's probably the best example. The incumbent governor, Brian Kemp, was on Trump's bad side. Trump was attacking this guy publicly and wouldn't endorse him. He romped to re-election against Stacey Abrams, a pretty popular challenger, at the same time as uh, the MAGA candidate who had been nominated for the U.S. Senate, Herschel Walker, is heading to a runoff. In Pennsylvania, we had uh, Dr. Oz, you know, not exactly a MAGA guy, a little bit more moderate. Tied to the hip with Trump, though. So personally, there was a tie there. Yeah, pivoted pretty hard to the Senate in the general election. Not an election denier, as far as I know run pretty close in Pennsylvania in the U.S. Senate race. Meanwhile, in the governor race, a guy who participated in January 6th, Doug Mastriano was nominated and he got completely destroyed by the uh, Democratic governor nominee, Josh Shapiro. And the last one here is, I'm going to put some numbers to this. And I think that this, to me, is one of the most compelling, right? You had in Ohio, you had, in Ohio, folks, is a red state. You had uh, Governor Mike DeWine, and, and I believe there's only two two folks in the governor's race, two folks in the Senate race, so it really is a straight up, straight up, straight down. You had 2.5 million people vote for the Republican Governor Mike DeWine. I wouldn't call him a moderate. I, I wouldn't call him um, an ultra conservative, definitely not a MAGA person. He followed the science on the early COVID stuff. He was getting attacked by a lot of the MAGA folks for following the science. Um, you know, he's your traditional conservative governor, and he's not extreme on the social issues or culture war issues, to my knowledge. And then so he got 2.5 million votes. J.D. Vance got 2.15 million votes. That's 350,000 votes separating the governor of Ohio to the Trumpist 
ultra MAGA JD Vance, regardless of how he's going to legislate, that was the persona that he he brought into this. He focused on the culture wars. I think we can all agree on that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sometimes it's it's a matter of emphasis, isn't it? Because many of these candidates that we're talking about, the ones who ran pretty successfully, are quite conservative. I mean, Brian Kemp, the governor of Georgia, is certainly a very, very conservative candidate. But he, you know, did not run on this election conspiracy theory stuff, didn't run like a termly online incel like some of these other candidates did. And he did very well. And he proved that even in a swing state where a lot of the Republicans were the most afraid to go against Trump because you need every base vote, you need every Republican vote to squeak out a victory in a swing state. He showed that you could go against Trump even in this environment and still keep the GOP on side and and win a bunch of the independents and undecideds. And, and, and folks, we're talking about, John, we're talking about governors and Senate races. And I'm going to stick with Ohio to use this as an example. So there were also a lot of crappy MAGA House candidates. But before we get into that, more specifically, in a race like Ohio, you have Mike DeWine. Folks, he won by 25 points. So his his race was was not even close. So that is to say, he's not going to bring people out because people know that the race is not even going to be contested. Uh, J.D. Vance, the other statewide on the ticket, wasn't liked. He ran 350,000 votes behind the governor. So that is to say, in a lot of these races, I think the same would apply to Pennsylvania. You didn't have a candidate at the top of the ticket in Pennsylvania with the freak Mastriano who dressed up in Confederate garb as a pastime to, to have fun as a hobby uh, because he's a racist, disgusting type of a human. You didn't have folks in Ohio, folks in Pennsylvania at the top of the ticket as a Republican that were driving people out to vote. I mean, they were driving certain people out, but generally speaking, they weren't driving everybody out. There wasn't great enthusiasm. There wasn't a unifier who could bring together the conservatives, the moderates, and everybody in between to get them out to vote. So you had a lagging effect for all of these House members. So not only were there bad House member candidates, but I would be surprised if the lack of candidate quality in some instances and where you had quality candidates, there weren't competitive races driving turnout ultimately also hurt uh, the down-ballot races. And and one race that I'd like to focus on, just to show that this MAGA type of candidate wasn't only in the Senate or the governor, and where this is the sole reason, one of the driving factors for why the election is so close in the House as well, was Marcy Kapter's district in Ohio. It was uh, another one of those New Hampshire one, Virginia seven, very close, maybe a little bit Republican district this cycle with the with the redistricting. She ran against a Trump freak. I, I can't pronounce his name right. It's Majewski. He was making up stories about his military service, and he was a big MAGA guy. Um, and this was a seat that was winnable. So I think a combination of no real top ticket on the ballot, um, but also just bad candidates down ballot uh, cost them that race and cost them, John and I could probably rifle off 10 or 20 more house races. I, I think Justin could probably rifle off house races more <laughs> proficiently than I could. But um, you know, one thing that you mentioned that I kind of caught on to there, was talking about how Ohio has become this, what is it, ruby red state that you said, a dark red state, whatever. Um, I think this is important to take a note of of how states can change and how much more fluid the political map is than we sometimes think. I think that a lot of us who whose first memory of politics was the 2000 election and whose understanding of politics is based on the post-2000 election era, we've got sometimes a too fixed idea of the way the political map works because we were looking at this same map again and again and again. And we have to realize that The country is fluid, the political system is fluid, and states can move in and out of these columns a lot more commonly than we sometimes appreciate. So, you know, looking at President Obama, who he won Ohio, he won Florida, and he won Indiana. Indiana, yep. Indiana electoral votes. North Carolina. Presidential race. Yeah, although North Carolina is looking pretty competitive these days. Uh, So, you know, Obama won huge electoral college victory, winning these states that seemed completely out of reach for Democrats in today's environment. But he never won Georgia or Arizona. And those are states that moved into the Democratic column when Biden was a nominee. 
Uh, if you take a look at Bill Clinton's electoral maps, a lot of younger Americans would be shocked when they look at the red and blue states because they would see Louisiana, Arkansas, West Virginia, you know, voting for Democrats. And that's something that you never see anymore. Although they do win statewide in that Senate race in uh, West Virginia with Joe Manchin. And then uh, Republicans can win statewide in a place like Vermont. And Vermont, I think, is a state that I wanted to mention because I found this fascinating piece of trivia when we were getting ready for this election, which was that Vermont is the was the only state in the United States that had never elected a woman to Congress ever. It was Vermont. Vermont was the last one. And Vermont elected a woman, I believe, last night for their at-large House district. So now all 50 of our states uh, will have elected women to the U.S. Congress plus the District of Columbia. Two more stats for you, John, that, that I found interesting. This one shocked me. I found it out at work today from a colleague who is from Baltimore. Wes Moore won the governor of Maryland. So a Democrat took a, taking over for Larry Hogan. It's only the third black governor in American history, which is appalling. If you yeah, really sit remarkable. down and think about it. Yeah, remarkable in a bad way. When I heard that, I heard that said too, I was shocked by it because I had assumed that uh, during Reconstruction, there would have been black governors elected in, in Southern states. But I looked it up and it is it is absolutely true that Westmore is only the third. And I saw him interviewed today on CNN and I was thinking, could could we be looking at a future presidential candidate? Jesus, John. You know, it's hard not to think about these things when- This election's not over yet, man. And I'm not usually one to jump <laughs> ahead uh, quite as much as that. What are you doing, man? <laughs> when someone is doing a national interview- it sometimes gives you an idea about what they might be thinking about their own future. And certainly on the Republican side, we've been seeing quite a bit of that. Uh, we've been seeing how the, the pundit class on the GOP side are really starting to rally the troops around this guy, Ron DeSantis, who is the governor of Florida. And they're pushing very, very hard for their own voters, their own audience to accept him as the coronated future nominee for president. And this is a, a pretty big deal for how the next few years in U.S. politics are probably going to uh, are going to turn out. So let's get into that. So, OK, we've just recapped the fundamentals. We've recapped candidate quality. I made the point about um, extreme conservative policies, even potentially being a turnoff. And I think that this kind of melds together what caused the, the, the results that we are currently witnessing and what the takeaways will be. And I think that ultimately one takeaway is we got to move, if you're a Republican, we got to move away from Donald Trump. Sure. That is great. I fear that because Ron DeSantis, he won by 16 or 17 points. Marco Rubio also won by a ridiculous amount. So that is that goes to show you folks Candidate quality was not what did it in Florida, because if Marco Rubio is winning by just one point less than Ron DeSantis, and he is really not that quality of a candidate anymore. It would be challenging to find people who are enthusiastic about Marco Rubio. Even in his own, especially in his own state, because they yeah, know him more. Yeah. It's, thank you, John. Yeah. Um, so, so that is to say, in my opinion, the 16, 17 point victory, that's Florida. That is Florida right now in a midterm, right? Um, that is that is what we're looking at. It's not Ron DeSantis' strength. But what I am concerned about for the country, really, is that ultimately these Republicans are fleeing to Ron DeSantis because he's Trump without the character, right? He is a culture warrior where he tries to use the law to subjugate his opponents in, in a lot of cases. And there are, are a wide range of examples of this. Um, that, that we can point to. Not only that, he's an asshole. He is the type of person that views the pub, the press as the enemy of the people. Um, he generally is abrasive towards press trying to be the fourth estate and just ask questions so that the voters can be informed. Uh, more so though, he is the type of person that only takes questions from conservative outlets or uh, to be more accurate because he'll take questions from other outlets. He only gives interviews to his preferred type of outlets. Uh, so that is to say, in, in a lot of ways, he is Trump without the um, Trump baggage, and he's actually even more conservative. So there is a concern, especially, John, in the post-Dobbs movement, where abortion, in, in my opinion, I, I said this before the election, I'll say this now, abortion not only drove turnout, youth turnout. It not only drove 
female turnout to women turnout to to the Democrats from independents and even some soft Republicans. What Dobbs was able to do, it was able to give folks and voters who are not super online something culturally to contrast these extreme MAGA candidates with. So if they're going on these extreme culture wars against the LGBTQ community and they're trying to subjugate the others, uh, this is something that will resonate with voters that want to vote for uh, liberalizing abortion because it stands in stark contrast to those values. They, They are illiberal values that are being pushed by a lot of these MAGA candidates and Ron DeSantis himself. So that is to say, there is a push to to get Ron DeSantis and flee Trump. I think, John, that this will likely backfire. Well, let me give you my thoughts on the whole DeSantis phenomenon for what it is. And it's based on a little bit of Kremlinology, so to speak. So I'm looking back at the experience before the 2016 election, during the 2016 primaries. And I'm remembering the way that Fox News was positioned and and reacted at this time. And this has been forgotten, I think, by many people. But Fox News was the most anti-Trump, and they held out the longest against Trump than really almost any part of American media. Throughout the whole primary process, Trump was being hyped up quite a bit by CNN and MSNBC on, on the cable news networks. But Fox was pushing pretty hard against Trump, especially after Trump uh, attacked, insulted their star anchor at the time, this woman, Megyn Kelly. Fox News was very reluctant to embrace Trump at all. Once he was the nominee, they got on board and they backed him. But they did look here and there for opportunities to try to you know, offload him. Uh, after the 2020 election, Fox News initially took the position of you know, reporting the election results and defending them and the legitimacy of the election results. So they started bleeding some viewers over to these upstart would-be cable rivals, Newsmax and OINN. Then they had to get back on side with Trump. And so I think that what the people in these institutions, both Fox News and also a lot of the institutional GOP who followed a kind of similar trajectory and throughout Trump's presidency were always said to be in back rooms criticizing him saying they couldn't wait to get rid of him. I think what they perceived was that their big problem was they couldn't find another charismatic, popular figure that the voting base that supported Trump could switch to. This was a big problem during the 2016 primaries. All the other candidates, they didn't have that X factor and they didn't have the kind of affection among the really riled up base voters that Trump had. And I think that Fox News institutional GOP perceived this and said, we need to find someone who could offer us this and build that person up. And that's the project that they've been on for the last two years with Ron DeSantis. Fox News and a lot of these other media entities have become 24-hour Ron DeSantis hype networks, and they've been trying to get their voters to actually, in their audiences, to really embrace him, to get excited about him, not just to think, oh, you know, this could be a potential, you know, alternative to Trump that we could, they, they want to build that love and passion for him that Trump has. And they've been putting their machine at work to do this. And now they have even more ammunition than ever because of these results that demonstrate that DeSantis is a winner and Trump is a loser. It's time to really make the switch. And hopefully they, you know, from their perspective, they've primed their audience and their voters to accept that switch. Yes, John. And I'm I'm trying not to get all the way down into 2024, bringing it back to 2022 to really crystallize what you've been saying and and what what I've been trying to say is that ultimately, I think that the shift from Trump to DeSantis will be one where instead of taking a moral inventory, so to speak, of a a true self-reckoning, they're going to say, okay, it was the messenger. Let's just get folks like DeSantis when... In reality, it is in a primary, it will work. DeSantis would work. Um, But for a general election, as we see in 2022, I think largely speaking, you'll see anything in, in, you know, one off of a state or a congressional district. Uh, But I think that ultimately America's kind of sick of the abrasive politician. You mentioned Donald Trump's going to be running on a personal revenge tour. I, th- I think that 
the independents and flippable voters, and especially the Democrats who are going to turn out against a candidate, um, it's it's not a winning strategy to put up somebody that is an asshole for being an asshole. And, and that is largely one of the GOP strategies, right? And, and Ron DeSantis um, fits that to a T. Not, not only is he odd, like he's, he's an odd person, um, but but he's a, some of his affect of being abrasive is largely his appeal. I think that also um, uh, trying to run and give uh, make your opponents feel pain, I, I think that largely speaking, America's ready to cool down the political temperature a little bit. These are the lessons that should be taken for the GOP from this election. And, and even more specifically, let's look at the governors who, or, or the folks that really blew it out of the park, right? Chris Sununu, you can disagree with his policies, seems like a pretty damn good guy. And, and in his speech where he won, he's like, America is ready to turn down the political heat. Let's have some fun. That, that's what I want. Mike DeWine, his effect is reserved and calm and cool and collected. He's not out there saying, fuck you, John, you're an asshole. And that's his stump speech, like a lot of these other politicians. Um, so, so that needs to be lesson one. I think that America is loud and clear saying we're ready to turn the page. If, if the House results in 2016, 2018, 2020 weren't enough, I think maybe 2022 uh, should should be something that that should be looked at by the Republican Party, and the same thing goes in the Democratic Party, right? The people that performed well, Raphael Warnock, Senator Warnock, is considered to be a genuinely nice guy. Uh, there, Mark Kelly, I mean, his wife is Gabrielle Giffords, a survivor of an assassination attempt. He's Captain America, an astronaut. He's but he's not like boisterous and and over the top and hyperbolic. He's demeanor is low key. He uh, walks quietly and carries a big stick. This is a new type of politician that is being held up by the electorate. And I don't want to make over generalizations, but it's one of the aspects, Sean, of this outcome that makes me the most hopeful. We're back to decent human beings. I don't in- really disagree that much with what you've just said, but trying to apply it to this media phenomenon around Ron DeSantis is a little bit tricky because you can tell, and again, we're going into the Kremlinology here, but we can tell that what Fox News and the other entities that have been hyping up DeSantis are thinking about isn't a general election, but the Republican primary process. And they're looking for somebody who could beat Donald Trump or win a similar type of affection among voters as Trump did. And so in their perception, and I think this might be true, the person who can replace Trump was never going to be, you know, Charlie Baker. It was going to be someone who was also angry and also a quote unquote fighter and also tough and strong and all of this. And that's why they've presented DeSantis to their audiences this way. Is that really who DeSantis is? And is the DeSantis that people are going to meet in a primary the same as the one that they've been told about? I don't know. I mean, the real DeSantis isn't this magnetic thug necessarily. It's a guy who's quite a bit nasally. It's a guy who went to Yale. It's a guy who's a bit antisocial. He's not exactly the character that he's been built up to be. But this is who Fox News and the others think that the Republican primary electorate wants. And this is, again, based perhaps on an overinterpretation of that 2016 election, because the Republican primary electorate isn't just the electorate that chose Trump. It's also the electorate that chose Mitt Romney and Bob Dole, right? So we don't know exactly what they're going to be in the mood for in 2024, but this is what the stakeholders think they're in the mood for. And that's going to impact you know, how all these candidates are being presented in the run up to that event. But we'll see. So I think the electorate thirsts for a John McCain, somebody who's authentic, even, even if it's a Democrat, right? Um, John McCain was rather abrasive, but he was authentic and he was a true fighter by the sense of the word. He had courage. Don't get me going. I could wax poetic about John McCain. I think Ron DeSantis, the way you describe him is accurate down to the T of calling him a thug. Because that's that's really what he aspires to be. It's it's this type of rabble rouser that is bigger than life. He's not bigger than life. He's just your common petty thug. And the thing that we need to take account of, John, is how much of this do these conservative networks think will resonate with voters in a general election? How much do they think will resonate with voters in a primary and how much do they throw all of that out 
and only care what will resonate with their viewers. So they seek to create this political monster that will drive up their ratings and in so facto actually determine the outcome of the primary. You know, the funny thing is that the hype machine around DeSantis, what it reminds me of the most isn't Trump. It's not McCain. It's not Romney or Dole, or certainly not the Bushes. The one it reminds me of the most is Chris Christie and how there was a conservative-leaning media hype machine around Christie that was built on his strong performance in state governor races, competitive governor races, and was built on his abrasive, quasi-thuggish, anti-media, bullying persona. And he looked really, really strong after the 2012 presidential election when his supposed intervention to embrace Obama helped tank Romney. That was the way it was interpreted after the hurricane. And then after the 2013 governor race, when he was reelected with a huge margin in a state that usually votes Democratic, he looked like he was going to be unbeatable going to the next presidential election. And then what happened? A series of scandals, Bridgegate. the decline of his popularity in the state. And by the time that a presidential election came around, he was a much diminished figure. And that could very well happen with the new boyfriend of Fox News, uh, Ron DeSantis. <laughs> It's a reminder that we do not know what's going to happen over the next two years. There's going to be so much news every week. This John, week. we don't know what's going to happen next week by the time uh, you know the dust settles and and who's going to be in control of the Senate or the, or the House. Yeah, by the time the uh, the Senate runoff happens in Georgia, there will be lots of news. And the way that the votes shake out in Arizona and Nevada are going to impact the Georgia thing it, very much. It, I mean. If control of the U.S. Senate is on the line, I think that that might help Walker. But if it's not, and it's just whether you're going to be the 51st vote, you know, you might think that might it might help Warnock, that voters would would know you're not deciding who's control of the Senate. You're just deciding who's going to be representing you. Do you want it to be him or do you want it to be him? Maybe it's something, a dynamic that would help Warnock. But yeah, there's going to be plenty of news that will happen even before that. It's going to be much more news than that happening before 2024. And I agree totally. If if the Democrats win in Nevada and they win in Arizona, Georgia's going to Warnock. If the Democrats uh, win in Arizona and lose in Nevada, and it's you know this is for the uh, what would that be the fifty first seat? Walker has a much better chance, but President Trump's going to get involved. So we have no idea. Is President Trump going to announce during this runoff? Is he going to wait until after the runoff? Is he going to spend his whole time campaigning in Georgia? Is he going to stay out of it? I don't know. And that's going to totally upend the race in, in, a, in, a, in a different way. But just to close this loop, I, I think that ultimately we're talking about this because of takeaways that, the, that, that we, are, we are making. But And what I'm saying is I'm projecting these takeaways will be the wrong ones that the Republicans gravitate towards. You know, because we've been talking so much about candidate quality, I think that we should talk a little bit about how some of the policy issues have impacted this race. A few things that I wanted to say were about the GOP platform and how they've responded to some of the real problems that are that have been happening in the country over the last couple of years, right? And I, I think that if they've underperformed, part of it might be because they either haven't offered much in the way of solutions or what they've offered lacks a bit of credibility, right? So for example, we know that inflation is, is a genuine issue in the economy. We've been talking about that tonight. Uh, we know that crime is a real issue. Public safety is, is a real issue. It's always important. It's always important, even when it's low. But um, there have been increases in, in crime rates, especially in rural parts of the country, but also in, in cities in the country. That's a real, it's a real issue. And then uh, there's government ethics matters. Uh, that the Republicans have tried to raise often, right? The, the congressional stock trading, it, it's, a, it's a big deal. And Pelosi has been unfortunately reluctant to do something serious to address it. McCarthy has been proposing things that on paper look stronger. So that's another issue. But the Republicans lack credibility on all of these topics. Um, and I think that that's something that probably has hurt them in this campaign. You know, the major thing that we can put on public policy that's driving in inflation it has been big federal spending. There's lots of other stuff, you know, the supply chain issues as we've got out of, of COVID and with the zero COVID lockdown in China, how this impacted the supply chain, uh, the war in Ukraine, how this impacted energy prices and so on. But when we look at US government policy, we can look at the spending and say that 
much more money in the economy has raised prices, right? The Republicans lack credibility on this. I fundamentally disagree that this played a role in this election. I think we're getting, I agree, they lack credibility. I think it's largely due to messaging and not not having a clear policy. I think it's due to who the messenger is. And largely, I think it's campaign qual- uh, candidate quality. Now, now, this is to say, there's an old adage in politics, you're ex- if you're explaining, you're losing, which, you know, it, it's overblown. But ultimately, I would like to say that I don't think voters going into the booth or listening, generally speaking, the overwhelming majority, I'll throw a number, 95, 98% are thinking to themselves, oh, the Republicans did these conservative tax cuts. They drove up the deficit. So therefore, when they say they're not going to spend, they're not credible. I think nobody is thinking about that. I think that for a discussion, it's a wonderful thing, but I think that campaigning is is more simple than that. And to win a midterm like this, historically speaking, you don't need to give elaborate policy priorities. You don't even need to go in and explain them. Newt Gingrich's contract with America was was rather simple and, and not much policy, and it's lauded as one of the great things. You just need to oppose the party in power. And I think because of the Trump impact and the type of candidates that we had who were weird, who were extreme, and who were just saying things that were unbelievable, it undermined the rest of their message. And because a lot of these folks were at the top of the ticket, it undermined the message from the folks on the lower levels of the ticket. Because as you know, John, uh, the Senate races typically have the most money, so they're the ones buying the ads statewide. So even if a candidate is running a perfect race in a House district, they're still going to be tarred and tarnished um, by the the ads and, and the campaigns by the by the folks at the top of the ticket. That is to say, I, I agree with you from from a logical and intellectual perspective. They are not credible on, on all of these policies that you want to run through. Well, Justin, there are a lot of voters who are paying attention to what government is doing. It's not nobody. Remember, we're talking about people who are going out and voting. We're not just talking about everybody in the country, including you know people who are 14 years old. We're talking about people who are engaged participants in the democratic process. You mentioned when you're explaining your policy solutions, you might be getting in trouble. That is certainly something that occurred in this recent election cycle because we had Rick Scott and Kevin McCarthy both tell the press that they're policy priority on economic matters was going to be to try to force cuts to Social Security and Medicare, which is one of the most unpopular things to propose in US government. And it is something that I was actually surprised was not a bigger feature of some of the campaigns. Too esoteric. You think that Social Security and Medicare is esoteric? I think that explaining it coming from a senator from Florida and 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 being rejected by Mitch McConnell and why this matters is not the most coherent political message for a district in, um, I don't know, in Ohio. (laughs) Back to what we were saying about the credibility on some of these other topics. During the 2010s, this issue about government spending was a huge, huge part of their GOP message. In the 2010 election cycle and onwards, 2012, 2014, they talked about government spending all the time. It was arguably the number one topic in in their campaigns and their campaign messages. And they really are not able to play this out again persuasively because people do remember what happened the last time they had unified control of government. I mean, people aren't completely unaware of that. I worked for a Tea Party member who rose to prominence in the 2010 election that you're mentioning. Ultimately, President Trump through 2016 forward killed the spending narrative for the Republican Party. Voters yeah, just yeah. do not care about that. It's not the credibility issue. It's that Trump fundamentally changed the platform. He he deprioritized this issue as being the main central focus which was so effective in the in the 2010 midterms. And and I think that it's largely um an issue that didn't land because voters don't care about it. I mean, that's not that different from what I'm saying, because if you're talking about inflation in the economy, generally, generally, the thing that you would then point to is spending. You would say inflation, spending, but there isn't an appetite for that because of the way the campaigns have shifted. 
And there isn't the ability to persuasively make the argument because of the credibility issue. Uh, the, the crime factor. Uh, this, like we've been saying, is something that matters. There are people who say that it doesn't matter, and that's ridiculous. But the question then becomes, what's the solution? And we haven't really seen many credible solutions from the GOP. In fact, what we've been seeing instead is an, a call to increase proliferation of firearms, make them easier for dangerous people to get access to. That doesn't seem to be something that would have a positive impact on crime rates, right? And then the government ethics matters. I mean, certainly the Republicans had a lot of success pointing at Hillary Clinton over government ethics issues. And they would like to do the same thing with Biden, especially with some of the real genuine controversies around his son, Hunter Biden, right? But it's so difficult to effectively bring those kinds of issues to the table when you've just had four years of Donald Trump. So I just categorically disagree with your um, characterization of these economic issues. When the last poll that I saw in the New York Times on October 22nd um, asked voters who who they trusted more about the economy, Republicans or Democrats, and it was Republicans over Democrats, 64 to 30%. So I think that for voters that actually cared about the economy, it wasn't that the Republican message wasn't necessarily credible. It because of you know inflation being a driver or government spending being a driver of inflation in this um, you know very accurate but convoluted depiction. Because the polling that we have, and there are you know there are hundreds of polls that show Republicans being significantly more trusted on the economy. I think largely it was not the message, it was the messenger. And I think it, the polling and the stats kind of back that up to go with our last point, John. The fundamentals were skewed. The economy wasn't that bad. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the major issue in the economy that people aren't happy about, I mean, it's probably inflation and the stock market, right? And um, inflation, again, generally, in the world, when you've got inflation, <laughs> what as someone who was campaigning in opposition to the inflation would point to is spending. And we haven't really heard very much about that persuasively. So those are, you know, three of the of the areas where there seem to be credibility issues that would have benefited Republicans if they really had a little bit more meat on the bones of their campaign. Well, and in, in to just really hammer home on this economy point, uh, a month before the election, all the way through the election, there was the same criticism about Democrats. It was it was even worse. At least Republicans had a message. You know, we're not Democrats. Biden broke this economy. We're going to come in and fix it. We were just in office in 2018. Look to us. We will, we will fix everything. The Democrats didn't have a message. They, it, there was, we had Liz Smith on the show who told us that across the country and in New York, and it actually, New York, they're underperforming criminally, but but in a lot of different places, Democrats were ignoring and eschewing inflation and economic pain in favor of abortion. And that was something that she lamented. So I would argue neither party had a good message on inflation, but because the Republicans were in opposition, they were better suited to win this haphazard, ham-fisted messaging battle. I think that the real policy issue, though, that that truly animated this this race uh, and and really changed things, and we won't know until the exit polls come out, and this fits one of my priors, was abortion. If you look at how a lot of candidates ran their closing arguments, I mentioned Abigail Spanberger. It, you, John, pointed out to me that she she's in an R plus three district, so she should have, by all accounts, lost this race. She hit Yesley Vega, her opponent, on abortion repeatedly over and over and over again. You had Democrats, Bernie Sanders, for example, and progressives decrying the moderate messaging throughout this campaign at the at the closing last month or so by saying you should be focusing on the economy. This is where you need to put all of your effort. Voters are feeling pain. This needs to be the number one issue. And moderates and a lot of Democrats, because of what Liz Smith said, the, the the campaign strategist, focused on, due to groupthink, abortion. And the way that I look at this, if the the vote ended up being Republicans plus 6% for, for the whole vote of, of the House, so uh, they got 6% more of the vote, but it's going to be, they're going to win maybe 1% 
of the seats, 51% to, to 49, 2% of the seats, then that means to me, the moderates in the tough races that were focusing on abortion were resonating with voters. So that means they're turning out the youth vote. They're turning out women voters in their own party. They're getting independents who maybe don't vote or tend to vote Republican vote for them on abortion. And, and then lastly, they're also picking up some crossover Republican voters. So I would say as strong of an issue as any for the Democrats and as influential in this election, uh, including candidate quality for the Republicans, was abortion. Yeah, I mean, what we might be noticing here is a bit of a mismatch between the White House and what a lot of the congressional campaigns were doing on the Democratic side. I mean, when you said that you didn't think Democrats were focusing on inflation and talking about it, I mean, that's certainly not true of the White House. They were, we were talking about it earlier tonight. They were obsessed with prices. Uh, you were t- just talking about how Ron Klain was constantly talking about prices on Twitter, how they took extraordinary means to try to bring down gas prices. Uh, this was a fixation. They, they renamed their big domestic policy project from the Build Back Better to the Inflation Reduction Act. It, w- it was a fixation. I'm talking about the last month of the election, where if you look at the closing speeches of the White House... They were not mainly inflation themed. They were democracy. So, yeah, so, so it was a, it, right. it, like prioritizing yeah, yeah. the issue. And what the White House told these campaigns was that the economic situation isn't as bad as people are making it out to be. Don't focus on it as much. And the White House didn't. Yeah. Well, what I was going to say was that the mismatch uh, between the White House and a lot of the congressional campaigns on the abortion issue, because you do not really hear – President Biden talking about this very often. And people have said that he appears very uncomfortable talking about it. I think that's probably true. And I think you're right that uh, certainly in the last week, he made a big speech about democracy. And so I think that this was perhaps because the White House were worried that all of the attempts that they had made to try to rein in inflation and bring down gas prices weren't working, um, even though they had been focusing on this all year. They were down in the last week and they said, wow, you know, our, our main priority, we haven't really succeeded at our goal. So let's find another topic to try to to focus on in the in the final week, and and that was a topic that Biden was comfortable on, and or yeah, sure uh, that he was comfortable on, and you know whatever that Philadelphia speech was as well that he was comfortable focusing on and, and interested in focusing on. So yeah, I think that maybe there is a bit of a mismatch between the way the White House and the way that the broader Democratic Party wanted to talk about the abortion issue and where it fit into their hierarchy of political priorities. And this is where I was wrong, John, and you were, I can't remember what your what your thoughts were on this, but I was pretty consistent. January 6th committee is not going to influence things politically. I was like uh, Hillary Rosen last night on CNN that they were being stupid for, for focusing on democracy as the closing message. Looking back, hindsight's twenty twenty. I think you said it, it would matter more, more than I thought it would. So, so I think you're right there. I also think that looking back, John, and seeing how many crazies were on the ballot, it really did juxtapose the choice for people. And, and it made it, it crystallized it. This is what you get if you elect these folks. You know, I think that there is a real misunderstanding of how those issues, the issues around democracy, January 6th, fit into the political spectrum. Because I've heard some pundits claim oh, this stuff is just for the progressives. It's just for the base, the the deep blue voters, uh, not the persuadables. And I think that's exactly the opposite of the dynamic. I think that the the real progressives, the deep blue voters are often the ones who care the least about that issue and care more about some of the progressive policy issues. But if you meet Republicans who have switched their votes to Democrat in the last four years, these are the voters who care the most about those issues. The, the independent, undecided swing voters. These are the ones, if you're switching your vote from GOP to Democrat in the tr- Trump and post-Trump era, it's very, very likely that this issue is a big priority for you. So I think that who those talking points play to and persuade is sometimes misunderstood. I'm one of those voters, John. I literally switched my career and, and went from working for the Republicans, and, and you know this, to working for the Democrats. And obviously, that means my votes. 2016, I was working for the Republicans. I still voted for Hillary Clinton because democracy was the number one issue. Um, so that is to say that I agree, I agree with you. 
And I just thought nobody, it, it wouldn't resonate with anybody. And the, these are the, a number of takeaways that make me hopeful for this country, because we know that in a general election, it's going to probably favor the Democrats uh, because of the top ticket for, for a variety of reasons. But to see in a midterm election, the trend be bucked and the White House use a closing argument about democracy and to overperform his, in a historical context is is very heartening. The, the last thing that I wanted to bring up here is Democrats left a lot on the table. And specifically in Wisconsin, they left a Senate seat on the table because they nominated a progressive who was highlighting Bernie Sanders' endorsement on Twitter. He had a history with the squad and he ran 45,000 votes behind his governor. The governor, Tony Evers, moderate, won. Uh, this, uh, this, this progressive Mandela Barnes uh, ran against one of the worst candidates incumbent running racist Ron Johnson, who, um, you know, he has a lot of flaws, but he was able to win uh, this seat. So if you mentioned this, John, in Pennsylvania, though, John Fetterman ran against a horrible candidate in Dr. Oz, who was from New Jersey, a rival state, and he just came to Pennsylvania to carpet bag and run. Fetterman ran, what, six, seven, eight points behind Josh Shapiro? Fetterman's another progressive, and there are a variety of reasons why. And this just may be a case, John, of my priors getting in the way of 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 the data here. But largely speaking, on national media outlets, I didn't hear from the squad the last three months. I didn't hear AOC. I didn't hear Talib. I didn't hear Omar. I didn't hear Bush. We reached out to these folks to get them on the shows. They weren't even doing podcasts. They weren't doing national media. They were being hidden. For good reason, because they are losers nationally. They win their small little districts. So uh, ultimately, that is to say, progressive policies may be popular. And this this goes back to our disagreement about Republican and the, the economic. The messengers are losers, electorally, of course. We did hear from Jayapal, but it was in the context of the letter about the Ukraine war that we spoke about in a previous program. I bet you a lot of Democrats wished we hadn't heard from her, though. Well, including most of the people who signed that letter, apparently. <laughs> but I think the point stands. Did you hear from the squad? Did, did you hear any headlines about them, despite them being catnip for the Republicans? No, yeah, I, I think you're right. I did not hear very much about Ocasio, for example, who had been a ubiquitous figure in American political life. And I, I don't know exactly how to explain that. Is it just the media that I'm seeing and interacting with? Is it a decision by her and her office to kind of buckle down and focus more on the day to day work? Or is it a, a, a significant proactive effort by the Democratic campaign to get her away from the media and or some combination of all of those factors? <laughs> I think it's uh, large, largely the latter. Uh, there, there is no work going on right now, Mr. Gunnison, as you know. Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, there's always the work that you might do in your district. And please trust me, I scan these conservative outlets. I have I follow some conservative folks on Twitter. I would have let you know if if there was a big blunder from one of the per, the, the members of the squad. They they just weren't out there. And now not not to really get into it, but Katie Porter is, is a beloved progressive in her California district. She's up by nine tenths of a point with 48% of the vote in. She is struggling to hold on. So so that is to say, um, in tough races, these, these people typically are not who you want to put your, put your cart behind. Despite that, this was still a, a historic night for Democrats. Yeah. You know, we're talking so much about how well the Democrats did in this election that we do, of course, have to acknowledge that the Republicans will likely take the House and still have a shot at the Senate. I mean, you mentioned Ron Johnson. I, I'd love to get some kind of explanation for why he is starting a third term in the U.S. Senate when he seems like one of the best examples of the two online uh, candidates that we're talking about. A, a guy who thinks the biggest issue in the country is Christopher Steele's memos. He somehow keeps winning 
election in a state that voted for Biden. It's it's a difficult thing to explain. I mean, you've offered one explanation, but he also won in his uh, first re-election campaign in 2016. So he's doing something right politically. Well, he used to be sane back then. In 2016? Yeah, he was viewed as this uh, establishment conservative who was a uh, self-made uh, you know, he's worth, I think, hundreds of millions of dollars, self-made yeah. uh, businessman. And that's how he rose to the, be chairman of the Senate Government Oversight Committee because he was respected with it. His personality totally changed. But John, I, I think you, you hit on a good point. Why are Justin and John harping on a historic night for the Democrats if they're still going to lose the House? And the, the reason is very important, folks. In the House, even if we are saying that these these Trump candidates – uh, cost this election. There's still 40 members of the House Freedom Caucus, which is the Tea Party, which is the MAGA wing of the party. If Kevin McCarthy and the GOP only have a three, four, five seat majority, he needs to be elected by a majority of his caucus to be the speaker. So there's a question, number one, will he become speaker? I think he will, even if it is a four, five, six, seven seat Four maybe is a little bit more difficult, but four, five, six, seven seat majority. But the second follow up question is if he's able to become speaker, how did he do it? So you had Mar- Marjorie Taylor Greene about two hours ago meet with Kevin McCarthy. And as she was coming out of his office, she was asked, Will you support Kevin McCarthy for speaker? And she said, No comment. <laughs> so, so that is to show you that ultimately what is going to happen is Kevin McCarthy is going to have to give in massively to the craziest wing of the GOP to gain speakership and then retain his speakership. And he will quickly learn that it is no fun governing when you are in a razor thin majority and you are also the minority party of, of the, uh, you're, you're not in control of the white house or the Senate in this case. Um, So what I think the net result is going to be, John, assuming that there's no, I don't want to say coup because we literally had these folks in this faction of the party throw a coup. Um, But if, if Speaker McCarthy isn't legally overthrown, I don't like, like Boehner was by my former boss. I lived through it. I, I experienced the uprising of the Freedom Caucus to overthrow a speaker, then what you're going to have happen is at all these lessons that, that you and I talked about running away from Trump and how I said they're going to take the wrong lessons, the House of Republicans is going to amplify the voices of Marjorie Taylor Greene, of Andy Biggs, of Paul Gozar, because they're going to wield power that McCarthy won't be able to stomp out. He won't be able to oppose it. And in the end, it it might be as big a political victory having these voices amplified for two years as if the Democrats had won the House by a seat or two. Yeah, I, I think you know there's so much more to say, but we'll probably end pretty soon. Just give our thoughts looking forward on what will happen in a Congress with the partisan balance that we're expecting. It does seem like McCarthy or whoever becomes the GOP speaker – or GOP leader, I should say, you know, will have a narrow majority and get to be Speaker of the House. And yeah, with that narrow majority, it's not going to be a lot of fun, that job. It reminds me in particular of the UK after the 2017 snap election when Theresa May did not have a majority in the House of Commons, had to govern in a confidence and supply arrangement with the Ulster Unionists of Northern Ireland and could not achieve anything, could not get any of her agenda. And some people have said it's not really quite the same because they're going to be in the majority in the House, but get to be an opposition party because they won't have the White House. They might not have the Senate. They're not going to be trying to do anything. But I think that that's wrong because we looked at what a nightmare this scenario was for John Boehner when he was in the exact same shoes and even with a larger majority um, after the 2010 elections. And um, it's really not very much fun. There is still stuff that you have to do. You can't just say no to everything. The, the big issue that we're going to be looking forward to in, in dread, I should say, looking forward to in a, in a negative way, I'm afraid, uh, if the balance is what we expect, is the debt ceiling. And McCarthy has already indicated that he is interested in holding the debt ceiling hostage. 
there's a chance the Democrats might try to do a permanent increase or a huge increase in the debt ceiling in the lame duck period, in the transition period after the election before the new Congress. That's something we'll see if they're, if they're able to achieve that. I think part of the reason that Democrats would be okay with this kind of outcome is that, you know, we didn't really hear that much from the Democrats about what they wanted to do in the next Congress if they retain the minor, uh, majority, perhaps because they weren't really expecting to retain the majority, but they seemed as though they've achieved most of what they wanted to legislatively uh, for, you know, Biden's term already. The Senate matters a lot for control because it impacts nominations. You need Senate approval to fill cabinet seats if you do it legally, that is, which, which Trump didn't, uh, and Supreme Court justices. We might have more vacancies in the Supreme Court if uh, anything happens to, you know, health problem with any of the older members or if someone decides to retire or older justices, I should say. So it's possible something like that could come up and the Senate control will matter a lot. The House, the Democrats were kind of at peace with losing the House, but it still matters. You know, we, we still have this debt ceiling vote and big spending uh, bills, you know, the annual spending bills that have to happen. So, um, you know, stuff is at stake, but I think the Democrats are going to kind of take the results with a bit of a smile. Yeah. And I, I just wanted to, again, follow up on, on what John said very briefly here. Although they're not in power, what happens from having lived through this is your most conservative, your most freaky members will want no government spending. They will want to wreck the system because they see President Biden as the head of the system and he will get the blame. So Kevin McCarthy is going to be really beholden to these folks. It's not just investigations into Hunter Biden's laptop that we need to be concerned about. I, I think John mentioned the, the biggest threat that we face, which is you know the debt ceiling. These are the folks for Kevin McCarthy or anybody, if this is a very razor thin margin, need to placate. And these folks are certifiable. The three that I named are nuts. And Lauren Boebert's not far behind if she holds on to her seat. Um, so that is to say that if the debt limit is raised and these folks don't want that to happen, then you'll have a new speaker if the margin is is razor thin. Otherwise, we're going to blow through. Uh, we'll, we'll, we won't raise the debt limit. We will default on our on our obligations. The United States will be put at a national security risk because of these people and Speaker McCarthy. And there are a whole host of government shutdowns we can look forward to. There, there are a variety of things uh, that, that will be very scary if this is a razor thin margin and somebody isn't able to gain control of these crazies. So I think that moving forward, there's a great political opportunity for the Democrats in this situation because it will show the the country how scary and freaky the the extremism wing of the Republican Party is. But there's also significant pause for concern. So so I think watching these events unfold will will be of the utmost importance. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Our next episode, releasing on Tuesday, will be with Scott Kennedy of CSIS. Scott Kennedy is a senior advisor and trustee chair in Chinese business and economics. With Scott, we talked about the Chinese Communist Party Congress. We talked about zero COVID and how it's impacting China's economy. We talked about the future of the business relationship, the commercial and economic relationship between the United States and China. I hope you will listen and enjoy.